to join the, the mailing list, you can add your email address to the website. And uh, usually in the first week of every month, we'll be sending you a newsletter. At this point as well, I'd like to welcome our viewers on YouTube. Um, both in the WebEx chat on, and on the YouTube chat, we'll be monitoring, um, looking for your questions and interaction in today's session. We very much encourage you to put forward your questions and your comments. If there are some examples from your local practice that you would like to have some further insight on, we very much encourage you to, to share those with us. Um, so that's from, from my side. For, I'll now be handing over to Dr. Abdul Razak, who will be giving you a um, brief overview of today's session. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zakaria. My name is uh, Abdul Razak Sultani. I'm uh, an, a faculty member at Qatar University and uh, an assistant uh, and uh, assistant professor, senior specialist in uh, academic assessment, evaluation, and uh, accreditation, which is a mouthful, uh, really. And I would like uh, to welcome uh, with me uh, my co moderator, Dr. Hannah Khalil. Thank you, Dr. Abdul Razak. Thank you, Dr. Zakaria. Um, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Hanan Khalil. I'll be co-moderating this session. Uh, I'm a faculty member at the Department of Physical Therapy and Rehabilitation Sciences at Qatar University, uh, and I'm looking forward to, to the session today. Thank you. So uh, yeah, today we will be giving you hopefully a, a, a flavor on uh, the pathological and clinical aspects of Parkinson's uh, disease. Uh, and we will try to contextualize the clinical practice as much as possible to the local perspective uh, in Qatar and the GCC region. Uh, and well, what we'll be covering will be mainly the, the key terminologies on movement disorders, uh, trying to differentiate between hypo and hyperkinetic uh, disorders. But the main emphasis, like I said, is about the, the etiological uh, factors, the risk factors, the pathophysiology or, and the pathological pathways of neurodegeneration in Parkinson's disease. We will talk about the clinical features, the investigations that are involved in the diagnostic uh, uh, process as well as differential diagnosis. And we will finish off by talking about the uh, clinical management uh, of uh, Parkinson's disease, and that would involve both motor and non-motor uh, symptoms. So I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Ghulam Adili. Uh, he's a consultant in neurologist, a movement disorder specialist, and a neurophysiologist in the Neuroscience Center in Hamad Medical uh, Corporation. Uh, Dr. Adley did his training in McGill University at Montreal in Canada in internal medicine. Then he joined the adult neurology training program at the University of Toronto uh, in Canada, where he finished his training in 2005. Then he did a fellowship training in movement disorder at the Movement Disorder Center in Toronto Western Hospital with Dr. Anthony Lang. Then he uh, traveled to Germany, where he did a further training and certification in neurophysiology in the uh, medical center in Hanover. And here currently, his main uh, time is divided between the clinical work serving his patients with neurological diseases uh, at Neuroscience Center Institute, sorry, in Hamad Medical Corporation, and also teaching junior residents uh, as part of their training and medical students as a clinical assistant professor at Qatar University and uh, at the College of Medicine. So we would like uh, to uh, thank you, Dr. Adley, for joining us. And without further ado, I would like to uh, pass you the, um, the microphone. Thank you. Thank you for this nice introduction. I appreciate it. And I really thank you for having me. But I think that to share, ah, the share is highlight now. Okay, and hopefully it's, and then we put it on. I think we are uh, set to go, isn't it? Yes, we're good to go. Okay. Uh, so, um, hello everybody, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So, um, what we are trying to learn today, the objectives are to define the key uh, terminology related to movement disorders, uh, contrast and compare hyperkinetic versus hypokinetic disorder, discuss the etiology, and the risk factor causing or possibly causing Parkinson's disease, describe the pathology and also to understand the pathophysiology of Parkinson's disease. Then to explain the clinical feature, investigation, differential diagnosis and management. It sounds like too much, but we'll try to make him make them as easy as, as they go. Uh, so um, 
there is no uh, relation to this uh, presentation. I have no conflict of interest that need to be disclosed. So to talk about movement disorder, just we have to make it simple or easy for the students or for the junior residents to see like where are we seated for the basal ganglia. We have to know a little bit uh, about the other areas that we could cause movement disorders like the pyramidal system. And when we say the pyramidal system, we are talking about the corticospinal tract and the corticobulbar, which is the corticospinal is the for the movement of the extremities and the corticobulbar is dealing with the cranial nerves. Uh, the other that's extra extra pyramidals are dealing with the tone, dealing with the proximal muscle adjustment movement when the, the first one is functioning. What type of abnormalities usually we really concern about, like to see if we are examining a patient with Parkinson's disease is to look for what we call it, it's um, the spasticity of the involvement. These are the more details of the way the corticospinal tracts originate. I don't think it's like in, in, important to discuss them now, but we'll talk about them later. The only thing I want you to know that the corticospinal tract has part of it, it's coming from the sensory um, uh, cortex. And this sensory cortex is not the one like dealing with the sensation that we have in the hands or feet or in the body. It's the sensation that, for example, when I'm sitting on a chair now and I want to do something like stand and walk, how do I feel the which part of my body is like touching the uh, chair or the seat? And then when I want to do the movement to adjust. So it's one of the concepts that sensory is part of the corticospinal tract. These are the Broadman uh, areas, how they are classified, and we'll talk about them later and uh, later. And this is like a, just a brief of the function of the different lobes of the brain. The frontal lobe is really important because most of them or the majority of the cases of Parkinson's disease, they will have frontal lobe uh, problems. And the frontal lobe is just to simplify it as if you are, when you are trying, for example, to cross um, a, a street, a large street, what you need at that time, you need your attention to know how large the street is and where you have to uh, plan to run or to cross from. And then you need your eye movement, the saccadic, which is the fast movement of the eyes to the left or right to adjust what you are uh, seeing. Then you have to plan your move based on the cars who are, are coming, like, it's, like a speedy car, the small cars coming or not. Then to make the choice and to alternate your function. For example, I'm running from this side to the mid of the uh, intersection. So then why do you have to stop there? Because the, uh, the cars will be coming from the different or the other direction. This is another job of the frontal loop. And while you are crossing, you need to maintain your behavior, like you're suppressed abnormal. You don't need to make the scene or faces or something for this, just because if your frontal lobe is controlling that. So this in brief, what is the frontal lobe does? The other jobs of the um, uh, other cortex are like, for example, the parietal is mainly the sensory and then occipital is visual and then the temporal is learning and memory. Uh, another uh, simple ex um, uh, simple um, uh, um, explanation, if I see, for example, a face, I see it in the occipital cortex. How do I know which uh, this face belongs to whom? So I could, I should transfer this picture to the visual association area to give it a meaning. Then I need some more information from the primary somatosensory cortex to, to know what is this face associated with. Is it like harm? Is it friendly? and what like I had experienced before, and then I formulate what exactly I should do. I should approach this person or I should run away from it, for example. This information will go to the motor association cortex where the things will be put in plan and sequence which one to start first and what is the appropriate way to execute it. And then the order goes to the primary motor cortex for, ex for execution. So, this is the spasticity and the, joint, uh, the positions of the upper and lower extremity, which is usually in the typical Parkinson's disease, you should not see it. If you see this type of features like in the Parkinson's disease, then you have to think of Parkinson plus happening there. So the other system that it gives me also movement disorder problem is the cerebellar disorder, which gives me the ataxia. In general, it's a co in coordination of movement or absence of order in the Greek world. So either it's like a um, truncal ataxia or limb and it's very uh, crucial to look at this um, picture here i don't know if you see my mouse here that as you see the steps are the, the heel of the and the other foot like for example it's so totally clear from the tip to, uh, toe from the other foot so what we are doing the stride length like what we are seeing here it's not a narrow steps if it's a parkinson disease this you will see it close it will not clear and they are like almost a distance of one foot like from each other 
they are not narrow based at what we see in the Parkinson's disease. In, in cerebellar disease, if you see a patient with Parkinson's symptoms that we will describe later, and but they have a wide based and they have a lurking type of these steps, then you know that there is not Parkinson's disease. This is a Parkinson plus. So what else we should look for for a cerebellar findings is finger to nose. But one thing I, I put an X on when you want to test for uh, cerebellar findings, you have to extend the elbow to touch that if you're looking for intentional uh, tremor, because if you do not extend the elbow, you will not uh, diagnose the early signs of of uh, cerebellar involvement and heel shin testing as well. This is another one. The only thing I want you to know, this is the cerebellum. And this is the, the midbrain, and this is the pons, and you see it's like a child hanging on the brain stem. This is the cortex, what we showed, like we said we there is a corticospinal tract and corticobulbar. There is another one, it's corticopontine fibers. The corticopontine fibers reaches the pons and then crosses to the opposite side of the cerebellum. Why? Because you need to, to the cortex needs to give the information to the cerebellum what they are planning to do and then to receive a feedback how much of this function is executed or, or, or it's accomplished. We'll not go into details of this one. You could read them later on your own. So by understanding spasticity and ataxia, then we go to the major part of this lecture, which is the basal ganglia. And when we say the basal ganglia disorders, we are talking about hypokinesia, which is like a low function, and we have hyperkinesia, which is more, a more function or extra function. In between these ones, there are some confusing things that some people always do refer to neurology, which is are like motor and sensory behavior. So for example, compulsion, mannerism, although these are related somehow to the basal ganglia, I will try to take them out of our way, just explaining them in, in short, um, um, in, in few minutes. Like compulsion is what we see in OCD. That's like a ritual, repetitive, like a fear or dread of something. And you are forced to do like the feelings. It's like an, what we, as I mentioned, um, OCD um, um, disorders. Mannerism is like some of the um, uh, abnormal uh, way of uh, doing something like drinking tea in a wrong way or something. These are like drawing attention and which, which we see in schizophrenia. This, uh, habits, it's the something we do that when we are sitting uh, either anxious or bored or tired and we do, do, we do repetitive movements, sometimes they are unconscious. We call them habits and they are not abnormal needed to be treated. A stereotopy is something like habits, but it happens in people with sensory dysfunction or cognitive impairment. Generally, I say that people are created or God created to move. If somebody is bedridden and cognitively impaired, he has to do any part of the body that's able. So that's why, and we do get referrals for these ones and needs, they are asking for how to treat them. Actually, these are the kind of functional type of treatment that do, do not need an, a treatment unless they are disturbing and the, the plan of management of this patient. So we took th those out, then we have to go back to the real um, uh, hypokinesia or the hyperkinesia. The hypokinesia, the two things we have is akinesia, it's like which um, totally no, uh, no movement, and then we have rigidity. The difference, rigidity and spasticity, as we see here, they are both like brothers of hyper, like brothers and the father is hypertonia. The difference of the spasticity, spasticity is a speed related. You have to move the joint in a rapid tone to detect it, especially early. But in rigidity, it's like you have to do like a distraction or uh, alternative movement to detect it. A spasticity is also selective muscles. Like for example, in lower extremity, it prefers the extensor muscles. In upper extremity is the flexor muscles, while rigidity is not like that. Um, a spasticity, as we mentioned, is a corticospinal tract. The rigidity is the basal ganglia. So, for hyperkinesia, we have several ones. To know these names, I put some like an easier or explanatory slide, slide here. So, how to break down a hyperkinetic movement disorder. And always I tell the juniors, describe what you see. Because by description, I could know better what he means. Because most of them that like, refer to me say, I have a patient with tremor. I don't, what, to, what do you mean by tremor? What do you mean by dystonia? So, if you have a hyperkinetic movement, first thing you have to tell me, is it rhythmic or non-rhythmic? Rhythmic means like both part of the movement are equal. Like if it's flexor, extensor, or pronator, asupinator, or like the head movement going back and forth. If it is rhythmic, that's easy. You're dealing with tremor. It's totally different. 
So if it's non-rhythmic, then the first question I will throw in, is it sustained? Like, for example, the patient is having like non-rhythmic and going to one side of the head, for example. Is it sustained and stays there and he has to touch the chin or something to get it back or not? If it's sustained, then we are dealing with dystonia. If it's not sustained that they go and they come back, then I will throw more questions into like, tell me, describe to me, is it slow? For example, what we call it's um, athetosis, it's writhing movement of the fingers, for example. It's a very slow and repetitive and they are not sustained. But if they are not slow, they are rapid, then we are they're going into a different thing. I first will ask if it's suppressible. If it's suppressible, it's a tics disorder. For example, the patient will do like this type of shake movement or something. But when they are, you ask them, do you have an internal urge or building up uh, urge inside you to do this movement? They say yes. Are you able to suppress it? They will be able to suppress it for a certain time or a period of time. Then they will take us directly to text disorder. But if they are not suppressable, then you are doing with myoclonus, which is sharp, rapid, fast movement of part of the body, or chorea or hemibelismus. Chorea is a dance type of thing, like a movement. The patient will be the moving like um, um, totally like in a, in a regular type of um, the direction, one side or another. Hemibelismus, it's chorea, but it's for proximal muscles. Chorea, it's more like a middle and distal muscles. And we have also chorea of the truncal. So from this slide, I can classify all like I can describe what am I talking with in a hyperkinetic movement disorder. Why that's important? For example, if I want to fit now Parkinson disease in this part, so where is Parkinson disease? Parkinson disease is two parts. One is hypokinesia, which is the uh, the, the movement is slowed and one part of it, it's rigidity, which the tone is increased. Plus there is one part of this hyperkinesia. Then what is Parkinson plus then? Parkinson plus is also Parkinson disease, but you are adding into it either spasticity or ataxia. So going from there, we are done with the explanation here. We go the mnemonic for Parkinson disease. I use the trap. Why I like this mnemonic? Because the posture and instability, it's the end. Always when I tell the students or the residents, if somebody comes with a posture and instability, he's falling from the beginning, think of an alternative diagnosis rather than Parkinson's disease. Because the prognosis, the management, these are all, all totally different. So T it stands for tremor and R for rigidity, a kinesia for like a paucity of movement and posture and instability. So if we want to define Parkinson's disease, the definition, it's a chronic and it's progressive disorder. It's a degenerative disorder like dopaminergic neuron in the brain are getting lost by time. So, and one thing to remember, and it stays always valid, it's asymmetric. It's one-sided. They have, we start with one side and then they may go to the next, as they progress, go to the opposite side. Once you have both sides, then you have to think of the alternative. When we see alternative ones, like especially medication induced or Parkinson plus disease. And so we need to go further with this one. So before they thought it could be like a part of industrial or a revolution, but uh, reviewing the history, there is something called Cambivata and it's like uh, described thousands years before, and it's consists of shaking and lack of muscular movement and they used to improve on a, on a plant, mucona, which contains levodopa. So it's not related to the what we think uh, industrial area. So it's epidemiology, it's around 0.3%. We're talking about the above 40 um, um, uh, years old in, in um, starting the disease. And it's around 18.6 per every 100,000 person per year. And male, it's a predominance uh, more than over female. And if it's below the age of 40, and some are talking now below the age of 50, it's it's called young onset uh, Parkinson disease. Uh, the young onset uh, Parkinson disease, uh, it's in management, term of management, they are not th that different. Some people prefer the dopamine agonist, but there are some certain features they are different, especially that there are so many centers that are recommending deep brain stimulation um, as a treatment as independency because they are young, they want to be active, and they may also develop more of like a dystonic or, or, or spasm type of movement, and they have less involvement of the cognitive functions. Uh, so etiology and risk factor, which they are presumed, they put so many things, and we'll talk about it later in details. 
And one thing here that what uh, really caught me that it's decreased by smoking. My interpretation for this smoking that people who smoke, who really smoke, at the age of onset of Parkinson's disease, which is around 60 years old, they are busy with other diseases like a stroke, heart attacks, respiratory damage, etc. So these are some of the inconclusive evidence for the risk factor of Parkinson's disease. Traumatic brain injury, as the, the, the um, Muhammad Ali Kilai, uh, low dietary and um, um, daughter and sunlight drive vitamin D, a history of um, midlife migraine, and as they go excessive weight, lower muscle strength in late adolescence, melanoma, prostate cancer. But as we mentioned, these are, they have inconclusive evidence to blame them. Generally speaking, we could say it's an interaction between genetic and environment issues so far and leading to cell death in certain area of the brain. And although the majority of PD are sporadic, but genetic factors play a role in the, those who are below 50 years of old. And we have autosomal dominant, less likely, but mostly autosomal recessive and some possible X-linked. This is a big list and it's expanding more and more like it's because of the, this genetic or young onset Parkinson's disease. The pathology, the traditional pathology we used to think about is like a neuronal loss, particularly in substantia nigra, parsa compacta, and the pontine leucus cerulius. So, and where you need up to 60% of neuronal loss to, to have the motor symptoms present. That's why most of the studies and most of the, the, um, the centers are now looking how to diagnose uh, with the prior to motor development or prior to motor symptoms because they are thinking if to target or to start a prophylaxis. So MRI, a volumetric MRI, they found that there is some atrophy of the hippocampal, but no cognitive impairment is associated. This is another explanatory slide. It tells you, it shows you the substantia nigra, how they look like in patients with Parkinson's uh, disease. Um, these are amyloid pathies or path uh, pathology. We'll just uh, skip them how to do the session. So, and then there was uh, some uh, neurologist called Heiko Brack challenged the traditional concept and he said, no, it's this is uh, the proposed pathology starts as at the medulla and uh, in the olfactory uh, bulb and then proceeds up. And this is the way this is like stage one and the presynaptic because they have a REM behavior sleep disorders as they progress in the start. So, this, it took like, it took um, really a good decade, the people discussing about it and accepting the idea because REM behavior disorders, mood disorders, they happen and then the motor. But there is something that what we see clinically, it's asymmetric. And this is lacking in this um, pathology of BRAC because it's bilateral. But we have a patient presenting with asymmetric involvement. And plus, they so far, they have no cell counts to correlate with the, what described the um, pathology scene, the cyniclean pathology. So, again, these are the, as we said, the non-motor symptoms. They are psychotic symptoms like impulse control disorder, hallucination, restless leg syndrome, REM behavior disorders, acting their dreams, autonomic dysfunction, sensory disorder, pain and paresthesia, and mood disturbance, cognitive impairment, etc. These are more details about the loss of sense, daytime sleepness. So, these are uh, that what the target of research, some of the centers, I believe also in Hamad University, it's they have also, they are developing these, are working on these biomarkers that they could use. I think the corona, since the corona hit in, I did, I could, did not have a contact because we were like so much busy in the hospital. So um, the pathophysiology is really worth uh, to pay attention and to understand it as to simplify it. The cerebral cortex sends a stimulatory to the striatum, the D1 and D2. And the D2, when they receive this stimulatory, unfortunately, they produce inhibitory uh, effect on their targets, which is globus pallidus, externa or interna or substantia nigra reticulata. If you are, if it's suppressing the reticulata and the, uh, the globus pallidus interna, this is good effect because this is the one um, responsible for suppressing the thalamus. And when the thalamus is suppressed, the cortex will not get a feedback and they cannot function. But the other part of this stimulation of the cortex that the D2 
is stimulated. When it's stronger, it suppresses the globus pallidus externa. The globus pallidus externa is a, doing a good job for our function or for our uh, movement. Why? Because they are the one inhibiting the subthalamic nuclei. What is the job of the subthalamic nuclei? When you block the GPI, the subthalamic nuclei will stimulate the globus pallidus interna and the, the globus, the substantia nigra reticulata. And these are the one are responsible to inhibit the thalamus. If we leave it at this way, there is no function. There was no, ex there was no execution function. So what we need, we need the substantia uh, nigra compacta to kick in. And how they come in? They come in with the stimulation of D1, suppression of D2. When they stimulate D1, they, they, what happens? They magnify the job of suppression of globus pallidus interna and sub, uh, substantia nigra reticulata. At the same time, they suppress D2, so D2 will not suppress globus pallidus externa. What happens? The globus pallidus e externa will be released, so it will put more pressure on the subthalamic nuclei. And when you kill or when you stop the subthalamic nuclei, so you have no stimulatory to globus pallidus interna. So what happens? You have one arm directly you're suppressing the globus pallidus interna. And the second arm, you block the subthalamic nuclei from stimulating it, so stimulating. So what happens? Then you have a blockage of the suppression of the thalamus. So when you have that one, the thalamus then will stimulate the cortex to do its job, and the job will be accomplished and will send the order. So there was no pausity of movement. Let's put it again in a way that's what happens in Parkinson's disease. So in Parkinson's disease, you have these two things are gone. So what happens? You have a less inhibition of the globus pallidus interna and subthalamic nuclear reticulata. There is less inhibition. There is no inhibition of the D2 receptor, so it will strongly sup like suppress the globus pallidus externa. And this will lead to what? No, no suppression of the subthalamic nuclei. And the subthalamic nuclei will be released and will cause like a strong stimulation. And this will be like a reduce and produce a strong inhibition of the thalamus then there is no feedback to the cortex and no um, movement. So that's what we will cause you the paucity or the akinesia we see in, in, um, in uh, Parkinson's disease. Okay, so that's the pathophysiology. The clinical features, different ones. We have the first or the most important one is the bradykinesia. And the bradykinesia is a broad, it's, um, we use it for uh, bradykinesia and hypokinesia. Uh, hypokinesia is really important because when you ask a patient with the Parkinson's disease to do a, like a movement, they start with a brady and they, they go to hypo. Why that's important? Because if you have just the bradykinesia, it could be something else like Parkinson plus, or it could be hypothyroidism, or it could be any other general. So in Parkinson's disease, you need the bradykinesia and you need the hypokinesia to go slower. So these are one of the ways that you could test for the bradykinesia these are the movements the tapping the, the tapping of the fingers and you have to ask them to widely open or tapping the feet and then we have the rest tremor and when we say the rest tremor we have to know the clinically how to rest them either to rest them in a disc or in a lap or to ask the patient to lie flat if it's not coming at that way you ask the patient to walk because while they are walking the arm is like the upper like arm is resting and you see the tremor is coming while the patient walks so this is one of the features of the, this is the differential diagnosis of tremor. We don't no need to go about it. Then it comes the other feature, which is rigidity and rigidity is movement of the joints. And if there is increased tone and a tremor at the same arm, then you find what we call it the cogwheel rigidity. Then the postural stability. The postural instability, as we mentioned, this should not be the early features of Parkinson's disease. If it's an early then, then you have to be careful about the diagnosis. How do you test for? Either the patient will tell you the history that they fall like a log backward and sometimes even forward. And then, <clears throat> and this is the way that we tested. We stand behind the patient and we ask them to separate their feet as much as they can, as comfortable they are, and then we pull them and they are allowed to take a step or two, but usually they should not fall because they, if they have instability, they will fall backward. Again, this should not be a prominent feature in the first five years. <clears throat> this is the gait, stooping, uh, stooping, like, uh, the, uh, as you see the stooping posture that he's taking, 
he has a slow and initiate walking he has a, sh a shortened a stride and he has like shuffling of the gait, which means like the small step they are faster and then as as they walk the tendency to run with this one we call it fascination reduced arm swing impaired balance while while especially we're talking uh, i mean while turning sorry falls in common are later and this is again to explain to you what i mean by the stride length and the, the length of the step they go shorter and they go narrower and this is the way that more explanation this is the normal and this is how they look with parkinson disease are these are the only features that in parkinson disease no we have also the speech the speech become monotonous hypophonic and they will have some like a very tiny stitch of a slurred in it um so the cognitive one, one third of the patient, mostly the elderly and not in a younger um, onset or young onset. And this is, you find it in the executive function that we explained earlier. We said, as if you are crossing the street, you plan, you execute, you alternate um, 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 the function and etc. You use your uh, judgment, etc. These are the ones that get involved in, in uh, Parkinson disease. Depression is also like happens in 40%, even it's considered one of the features that a premonitory or non motor that you see in Parkinson disease. So dysphagia, they should not be and the micrography and this one should not be like the prominent features. We have this uh, assessing overall severity of the Parkinson where going your staging, it's a unilateral disease. The stage one, stage two, once they be bilateral. Stage three, they have some instability, but it's still physically independent. And the stage four, where they use the aiding or something like to walk. A stage five, it's the, the one like a wheelchair seated. And as we see, these are really important. It's like when we are classifying the patient and when we are doing the rating scale to see where is he and what his response. And this is really crucial every three months to six months to, to repeat it on a, on a patient. These are the features more one more time. So just to emphasize on the diagnosis and what supports your diagnosis, which is like mainly clinical. So we say the patient will have a dramatic or a good response on dopaminergic treatment. Like when you are doing the UPR, UPDRS part three, you will see that he has a 30% improvement when they start. Usually, how do you do that? You could do it also with a single dose of 100 or 200 milligrams of levodopa with some treatment to uh, assess the uh, to prevent the nausea and vom vomiting for the first dose and you see that if there is a response to it or not then the um, uh, later on on the practice if you see this kinesia or abnormal movement like a um, choreic type movement that's also support you the rest the tremor usually unilateral at onset and the presence of either olfactory loss or some people even use the MIBG uh, sympathetic denervation of the heart, like you do it in cardiac um, study. So these are the supportive one. We usually do use the, the clinical one, the asymmetric involvement of the, um, uh, the tremor and the response, the dramatic response. The red flags that it could be always, we have to emphasize on them back and forth. It's a rapid progressive of gait. In five years, your patient in a wheelchair, then you have to rethink your diagnosis. Or the patient is on treatment. Be careful, like if on treatment, they are um, doing well in treatment, you keep that in mind. But if there is absence of progression of symptoms over the um, uh, years, uh, early bulbar dysfunction, choking, uh, nasal speech, maybe you are dealing with something else dysphonia this art like this like you have to deal like it's a parkinson plus or not and as we mentioned the first five years um, and then if there is a strider or a choking or um, respiratory type arrest the spouse is mentioning to you like then you have to think of parkinson plus especially multiple system atrophy what else we have severe autonomic features like for example orthostatic hypertension i know that levodopa carbidopa could cause that but with adjustment of the dose, we're giving some salt cubes, we're giving some um, sympathomimetic medication, they will respond. But somebody, you are trying these things and no, they are still having significant involvement. Again, also severe urinary retention, urinary incontinence in the first five years, this is point at the Parkinson plus. Um, more than uh, once I fall, we emphasize on that one. And then anterior colis, like involuntary flexion of the neck, 
um, a contraction of the hands and feet. This gives you like you are dealing with the CPD or corticobasal degeneration. Then absence of any or other uh, um, absence of any or uh, of the common non-motor features at what we describe sleep, REM behavior disorder, depression, etc. In the first five years, this will give you a hint that you are dealing possibly with medication induced, possibly with other disease. And from the beginning, bilateral symmetric Parkinsonism is also another cause that like, to think of a medication use or something else, especially if it's going further, then you have to look at uh, neuroimaging to see if they have like not dealing with a structural lesion in the brain. So what are the absolute exclusion criteria? If you have cerebellar involvement and it's really prominent, then you are dealing with multiple system atrophy. Uh, if you have a gay supranuclear gas palsy, and we are uh, we are talking about um, uh, down gate down gate uh, vertical saccade if it's impaired uh, behavioral variant of frontotemporal dementia within the first five years or a speech like a problem arrest of progressive aphasia uh, or you have like a restricted uh, also you have Parkinsonism that only restricted to the lower uh, lower part of the body so. This is what we use to call it the Parkinson uh, um, uh, vascular Parkinsonism or NPH normal pressure hydrocephalus in the first three years. Then um, if you have um, the, the, uh, the treatment of dopamine blockers in the prior like um, six months or one year. So. Uh, if you are giving um, uh, really a uh, um, high dose of levodopa and still you are not seeing any response, this is not Parkinson's disease, you think of something else. Uh, if you die, examine the patient and he has a cortical sensory loss, then you are dealing with corticobasal degeneration. And then the most and the, um, uh, helpful ones, if you are very, really in doubt, you do the functional neuroimaging PET scan. And you feel, see it's it's a normal uh, study. It's not showing any uh, dopaminergic deficit. So by that, we uh, will move to the investigation. As we said, clinical diagnosis is still the gold standard. And if you apply it, say so unilateral, uh, rest tremor, rigidity, uh, I'm sorry, rest tremor, uh, bradykinesia, and response to levodopa, et cetera. If you have below 50 years, and before we used to say below uh, 40 years, you think of Wilson disease, which is autosomal recessive, and it's a copper accumulation in the body. And it's curable if you diagnose it early. Unfortunately, it's um, um, uh, some of the cases I have, they are they miss the diagnosis. Um, a CT or MRI head scan if the diagnosis in doubt, like a typical presentation. What a typical presentation, as we mentioned, uh, somebody has like a cerebellar finding. Some others has like a vertical gaze involvement. Somebody has like a prominent falls. So these are the ones that you have to do neuroimaging, not always indicated. PET or SPECT may also um, help you to diagnose Parkinson's disease. Uh, olfactory testing now it's been used also for the pre-motor um, uh, uh, point uh, like pointing because these are the one and they are simple ways of testing because it also points at degenerative diseases like Alzheimer disease. Okay, so differential diagnosis, we talked about mo most of them because we are running short of time. At most of the differential diagnosis we talked about, but just to highlight, and we said, we said drug induced, it's bilateral type of things, and you have the history of the drug. Vascular Parkinsonism, we put a little bit more pressure because recently I found that most people are diagnosing it by mistake wrongly which is a lower limb Parkinson's disease. Then the Parkinson plus, which is multiple system atrophy, PSP, et cetera. And the Lewy body dementia, with this, which you have like the fluctuation of the cognition in the same day. So if we skip this one, so why I focus on, uh, on, um, on Parkinson plus syn syndrome uh, in uh, vascular Parkinsonism, because as I said, there are so many, the people who are wrongly diagnosing it. So, there is no abnormal structure imaging pattern is specific for this one. For example, some people say he has white matter changes and this is the pictures. No. And uh, so what we have so far, like there's a, co a poor correlation with this hyperintensity or microangiopathic lesion. The only thing that they found that it could be related or definitive vascular Park Parkinson, uh, Parkinsonism if uh, results ischemia in substantial nigra or its connection pathway with a sparing of the striatum and sparing of the cortex and uh, white matters. 
So if you have this, the substantia nigra, then, and you have the pathway, then these are the ones could tell you that this is, you're dealing with a real vascular Parkinsonism. So why is that? Because many cases reported as vascular Parkinson disease tend to be progressive supranuclear palsy, which is a Parkinson plus. And this is, this is a type of a disease that it's, as we said, it's rapid progressive, like more progressive. It's like a poor, a poorer prognosis that Parkinson disease. And unfortunately they lack the um, MRI features at the beginning. So, and then there is something called vascular pseudo Parkinsonism. Because you have a small vessel disease affecting the bilateral mesial frontal lobe. And it's giving you like a kinetic mutism. Somebody is not interacting, and you do not find the proper or the real one, like of uh, of rigidity or uh, slowing in the limbs or something. Just the behavioral type of things that they have. So this one you have to be careful because this is a vascular pseudo Parkinsonism, and then we have something called a pseudo vascular and pseudo Parkinsonism, which is the normal pressure hydrocephalus, and we have the trans epidemial ex exudate. And these ones they have a certain. Uh, MRI features that uh, could be, and why this is important, because these are the people may not benefit or maybe sometimes confuse you. They may benefit with a dopamine uh, treatment, but later on will uh, will uh, reverse and then may get even worse with the side effects as, as a posture. So, and they get a good response if you do the shunting, relieve the pressure of, of the brain. So, most common uh, causes of lower uh, body Parkinsonism. It's like we said, like a vascular one. If you think of like a differential diagnosis, one of the diseases that you, we have the cadazel, if you have the temporal lobe, white matter changes, although it's like a very extreme, like differential diagnosis, but it should be kept in the back of your mind. If somebody is coming with lower body Parkinsonism and he does not have the typical legions of involving the, um, the substantia nigra. So if you have hydrocephalus, then NPH is big questions and you take the sum of the measurement. Uh, if you have a hydrocephalus and you have a preventricular or deep white matter changes, then it could be a combination of NPH and vascular uh, Parkinsonism. And if you have a fall, uh, I mean, the patient is falling and they have a lower body Parkinson's and remarkable MRI, think of early um, progressive supranuclear palsy. I will put two lines under this one because the patient has lower limb parkinson and he is falling but the, your mri is not diagnosing that it's not giving you the features of nph so this needs um, a more frequent um, follow-up needs a speech pathology assessment needs the other one need a neuroophthalmology assessment to see over the freezing of the eyes or saccadic movements of the eye if it's involved especially the vertical ones then uh, the least, uh, the last but not the least one, if uh, you're having some like frontal lobe, um, a kinesia, a polyapathic ones, and you have to look for ischemia or tumors affecting the frontal lobe. So no Parkinson, no Parkinsonian sequelae is classic in vascular uh, syndrome. So let's see what is the, the to go run run of across this one. So. Uh, the most important one is the last one is uh, clinical features that of gait common to normal pressure hydrocephalus. Oh. Uh, where that one? Yeah. So the normal pressure hydrocephalus, when you, the patient, uh, do, you, do you want to diagnose it apart from that one? And I said, um, you did the MRI and the MRI showing some um, um, uh, increased size of the ventricles and the measurements are going with the NPH. And then what are the signs that you look for? The patient will tell you my feet are like glued to the to the ground. When they take a steps, there is like a length of the stride is less, uh, less and the height, they don't go much higher than from the, uh, the floor. The really one uh, one is unique to NPH when they walk the, the foot like outward rotated and they will walk like a duck like this, like, and it would be like a frozen to the ground. Um, why this is important again, as I see, as, as I told you, because vascular Parkinsonism has a different way of treatment. NPH is a totally surgical intervention and you could help. I have a, a, a colleague, Jordanian, uh, he is running a company, not a colleague, sorry, is a, uh, um, uh, a Jordanian uh, fellow who is like running a company with NPH, but um, uh, he was started before by a colleague somewhere in the, one of the Arab uh, countries. He was started in Levodopa Carvidopa. And then here by neuroimaging, we, the, we, we found that he has some changes that suggesting in pH, improved in lumbar puncture. Then with the shunt, he's running his own company now. So uh, management, 
not spend lot, lots of time. One thing that always ignored or uh, not ignored, not paid attention for here in Doha, the, the importance of physical therapy and important of regular exercises. So it's um, it's maintained. This is improve the mobility and the strength um, and rigidity relief also will be better. Muscle strength will be better. But the only thing you have to be cautious when turning, if there are some exercises that has a, like a sudden turn or something for falls. Then we have to keep in mind this slide because that we have the honeymoon that whenever like you give a medication, you have a good response and the wearing off is expected. Um, then, then the wearing off will be like faster and you start to give like higher dose. But as you see, the safety zone from this line goes lower. And as the patient goes above this with a medication here, when we they developed what you develop the extra movement or um, what we call a dyskinesia. And if he falls below the line, he will be rigid. And this is the time if it goes like more frequent and it's more than two hours per day and it's really disabling and especially the young patient at young age here, we have to think of advanced uh, type of treatment. It may not uh, or the help or the aid for uh, treatment. So what are we talking for the recommendation? As we said, it's either dopamine agonist. I personally prefer, I don't go with the age 60 and above or 60 or below, because this is how we were trained with Dr. Anthony Lang. It's like levodopa, carbidopa is a good one for both age. Um, dopamine agonist, we add on to smoothen the effect, uh, et cetera. And these are some of the side effects that you expect with a dopamine agonist, which I said the dopamine agonist is add on. And um, um, dopamine dysregulation syndrome is when the patient himself start to uh, take extra more and more dopamine to better relieve because he does not know the disease progression and the safety zone are slower. So he will end up having side effects. So this is one thing to be kept in mind. These are some of the treatment option. This is the um, apomorphin pump. Uh, this is the DBS, the brain stimulation, and this is what we do. We carry it is the adrenal, the adrenal, uh, the adrenal um, uh, injection of uh, levodopa, carbidopa. And this is where uh, where we usually like um, contrast which one goes for this one. As you see, the DBS has a green in a tremor pharmac pharmacoresistance. Because most of the other treatments, they do not target tremor, even when you are treating levodopa, carbidopa, and most of the people are bothered by tremor, because especially if it's a dominant hand. So now recently also they found this ultrasound guided tremor management, but for essential tremor, some of the centers in Spain or some centers in Europe started to use it in Parkinson, but uh, this is the one like the effect of its wear off like in one year time, but one of the options is like to do this one and some of the stereotactic type of treatment. So if you are thinking that bothering tremor pharmacoresistance, so the DBS one of the options, and if the patient is young and wants his dependent, so many centers, for example, in Germany, they, they go like more keen with the DBS. Why? Because it's... Um, relieve the loads from the system as well the follow up and these things that people the patient will be like more dependent on himself for uh, dudopa it's an expensive uh, drug of, of course but it has some area when the patient is contraindicated older age and contraindicated for surgical dbs especially because they put the age of 70 as a cut point for and some centers they take more if the if, if physiologically the patient is better So where you inject the dopamine in the into your intestine. So, and these are the people you have, like you have anxiety or depression and you they have dementia slightly. These are the options, the yellow ones. And then you have a red one. If you have like as a tremor, you see it's like red, red one is not the same as the um, apomorphine pump. For apomorphine pump, it's different. Like when you have a patient and uh, not determined. So this is because a procedure and this one is like not determined. It's like a procedure also, but this one is could be detached. Then you offer them apomorphine pump. As I say, we always put these options in front of the patient and we discuss which one suits the patient better. And we have to keep in mind that some of them are not reversible, like the DBS. While the Dudopa still, you could take it out and close the closure. The apomorphine is, is much uh, simpler. One more slide of apomorphine, no need to talk about it, and that will conclude uh, of uh, the lecture uh, for today. So what did I do? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Adli. That was uh, such a great overview on the motor disorders and with a particular emphasis on Parkinson's disease. We opened the floor for questions and 
I would like uh, to start with Dr. Halen, whether yes. you have uh, particular questions. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Adidi, for, for this very comprehensive, um, clear presentation about Parkinson's. You just went through the whole journey from um, the anatomy, the pathophysiology to, to, to the management. Um, it just strikes me that you spoke about the early um, onset of, of Parkinson's uh, disease. Um, and you mentioned that the clinical features would be different, the course of the disease would be different. But I just remember like a few years ago, I've been attending one of these conferences and there were fellows from Saudi Arabia who presented a paper claiming that um, uh, the age of the young onset um, that they've seen is higher than um, the normally reported in, in the literature. Um, so um, I, I just would like you to comment on your experience of seeing the patients at Qatar. Is this something um, that you? Uh, no, actually, what I have is more and more the amount of like elderly people. I'm not sure because also we still we didn't establish the the Parkinson like the movement disorder um, the center. Most of our patients also seek a. Uh, outside treatment unless like they'd run into troubles or they want more advice or something they come but most of the one i see they are elderly above 60 years of old like have like a few like countable one they are young onset and if i would say the young onset i still follow the school that below 40 but recently yeah. they are talking even below 50. Mm. yeah absolutely yeah even if Below 40, like even like from my observation in Jordan, for example, I've I've seen I've seen a lot where they have like the onset, the onset that they started to notice the symptoms below 40. And from from your experience and from what you see with the with the patients, is this something linked to the genetic factor that you've spoken about? Definitely, yeah, that's why whenever we have um, people are below 40 or below 50, uh, Wilson disease is one part like to rule out and then we will refer them to genetic to classify them to see if they have any possibility and the genetic section is very active here at Hammett Hospital and they, they do like their own, they, as the minute they receive the patient, they do their own uh, panel like involving the family and testing for like uh, other um, partner or some, something to see to uh, look for the cause and they uh, they come with the, um, the diagnosis. Yes, it's actually the young onset ones are they go to the genetic uh, testing. Yeah, uh, just to follow up on Dr. Hanan's uh, question on the genetic element with young onset uh, Parkinson's disease, when it comes to the clinical management, is there any key, are there any key differences uh, in managing early onset Parkinson's disease in patients uh, under 40 uh, and over 40? taken into account that element as well. Yeah, as I mentioned, there are more and more uh, people talking about independency. It's like, because these are young people, they start like, and they want to involve in life with kids and these things. So most of, also the cost is like a uh, issue also in this, some of the country European country, they go for DBS, the brain stimulation. Uh, but in terms of management of treatment, I go with what we used to do in Toronto and Canada, like it's a levodopa, carbidopa is uh, the, the one. But mm -hmm. uh, theoretically, they say below 65, it starts on dopamine agonist. But we have to keep in mind there's higher side effects in younger age for having like uh, impulse control, uh, hypersexuality, uh, shopping, and these things like side effects on, uh, on uh, dopamine agonist. Uh, so I still, from my side, if I start in younger age, of course, I will go with the weekly, weekly like uh, supported um, protective uh, uh, rasagiline or MAO inhibitors plus um, uh, levodopa, carbidopa, small, small dose. The dopamine agonist would be uh, secondary. But as I said, theoretically, some of the centers, if they are below 65, they go mainly with dopamine agonist. Uh, and then the, the levodopa, carbidopa, they put it later on after 65 is a year yeah. of age does that have uh, something to do as well with the long-term complications that come with uh levodopa because uh, you mentioned Actually, as well yeah. in the lecture that after five years that window of effective therapeutic um effect it uh, starts to narrow down and yeah. you will see one off effects and uh dyskinesias yes but what we did the follow-up we did even before from toronto and we did not find any difference like if you start actually you are depriving your patient from a good treatment which is levodopa carbidopa 
and yeah. you're giving the other one, which is an add on. If you want to smoothen the response, you add on the one of the dopamine agonist. But no, no clinical wise, no levodopa, carbidopa is still it's still a good uh, candidate to start with in both uh, age group. Excellent, Dr. Hanan, or anybody in the audience, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, write down your questions or, or um, activate your microphone. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, Doctor Doctor Adi, I'll I'll just move because I'm I'm a physiotherapist, um, and, and I I was I was happy to see the physiotherapy coming there. Um, just from the point of physiotherapy and other rehab therapists, when do you think that would be the best time to refer PT patients to these parts of therapy? As early as possible, I usually advise patients, even I even like uh, still I'm deciding because the tremor, for example, is mild and it's a left sided, he's right dominant and like I'm still justifying the treatment. I start the physiotherapy and exercise, regular exercise, because as active they are, the people who are active, they are much uh, better in, in the uh, progress, like in healthy life, uh, active life, this one as early as possible and physiotherapy targeted physiotherapy for uh, for parkinson disease i know you guys have a program for them also for parkinson disease um so yes as early as possible even before thinking of like uh, medications yeah not uh, only uh, passive also active physio like it's like they do exercise their own like cycling uh, like uh, swimming like this so they have to maintain activity this will give them they give them much better response to treatment as well uh, absolutely, I, I echo your voice uh, and I think there is a huge data now about how like being active and participating in regular exercise can even modify the course of the disease. Like data that's coming from the registry data that's coming from animal studies, they are strongly recommending this. So I, I really echo your voice. But I, I was really happy to hear this from you because it's um it's not always um the the routine of practice in, in a lot of places. So can you even in Doha, unfortunately. Unfortunately, even yeah, in Doha. And and, yeah, yeah. and and this is this is this is what I wanted to know more about because this is about local perspectives of Parkinson's. Yeah. I even tell my patients, don't wait if the appointments are here in Hamad are not available to go to private, go to any like don't if they, they take time. When you go there, learn from them. What can you do at home or what like equipment you could buy? We invest like we travel for like 20 or 30,000 real and for one uh, for two or three days. Invest in some of the equipment that you have at home, exercise regularly. And, but avoid and, avoid dehydration because our weather is not always nice. This is the the point because dehydration is the enemy of Parkinson's disease. It will worsen their symptoms. So, yeah. Um, and 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 within this regard, can you tell us more about like, for example, what you see in terms of the challenges for 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 following that route, for example, for people going to physical therapy or even other type of, of therapist that would be beneficial to them. I just wanted to know more about what's the, the local, the local what? challenge, the local exactly. challenge is yes. The local challenge I, I still have is to build the department. Uh, the problem is like most of the people who were um, interviewed like uh, from abroad to come and like to establish the department together here because it's still nobody is going into like movement disorder subspeciality and um, especially I combine them also with neurophysiology because we do we used to do like a neurophysiologic tremor study and dystonian etc <clears throat> most of the people who get interviewed unfortunately still they, they are not leaving these like specialties that people I like, prefer to stick to their own country even in India for example we could get like any like a general neurologist get, get, uh, even in, like for example in Pakistan even like in uh, in um, uh, some other like Arab world countries, Egypt or something, and they they uh, they interview, but none of them like as I said, they leave their home country to come to establish. So the most important thing we are uh, facing is so far is like to establish the uh, the uh, program here, and to have the multidisciplinary type of thing. We have we I mean trying to have my uh, my own physiotherapist, my own psychologist. Uh, my own like a junior um, or like an um, uh, PD nurse that like, does the UPDRS every six months to see the progression or the response. The follow up, I mean, this is the only thing like we are, uh, we are hoping, I'm hoping in the near future we could accomplish. So we could um, serve this community of Parkinson's disease in a much better way. 
Yeah, um, I, I, I totally agree with you. I think it's a bigger challenge at the level of the region. I think the number of movement disorder specialists at the level of the region, not only in Qatar, is very few yeah. and very limited. They don't come. Yeah, yeah, they don't. We are trying to recruit. They don't. I mean, they always like um, think of the situation. They want like, um, I mean, don't want to talk about them. Yeah, they, they don't like to. Uh, and it's very sad otherwise because the department needs a couple two or three like i'm uh, I'm, I'm on my own here as a movement disorder uh, so hopefully hopefully in the future things will change uh, absolutely and even like what you said about the multidisciplinary team it needs a specialized team people who are specialized in parkinson's yeah. at a different level from different yeah. health um, uh, profession backgrounds. Yes. Yeah, the nurses yeah. are really important. We, everywhere I worked in, they had like a, a specialized uh, trained, they call them PD nurse. And imagine that some of them, like in England, in, in King's College or in uh, this one, like these PD nurses, they, they could even suggest what medicine could be adjusted, then the doctor would do it. I mean, they reach to a level of a training that like they know what what to do with them, this one and they are the first line and the patient could call them like a hotline type of thing. So it's it's really it's really the important thing, it's the important part. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Would you like to add anything to this? Uh, yeah, uh, we, we have a few questions from, from the audience. So the first one uh, says regarding the shortness of breath and constipation symptoms. Are yep. these symptoms common and differentiated between uh, Parkinson's and Parkinson's plus, PD and PD plus? Yeah, the shortness of breath, especially if it's gasping or at night or something, this will give you a hint that you're dealing with Parkinson plus and multiple system atrophy type of thing. But the constipation, right. no. constipation that happens in, in, bo in both of them. Uh, but unless like you have some more like a thing, like a small fiber type of thing, will go more with the multiple system atrophy for sure. Hmm. Uh, thank you. And another question from the audience as well saying, are there any complementary therapies that would be beneficial for uh, PD patients, particularly the elderly, to complement the uh, standard treatment? And the, as I said, physical therapy. Physical therapy, uh, it's like a really, and a speech uh, pathology therapy, and uh, this one to be active, like to involve them in more active type of things. Uh, and if there is any other comorbid type of things like joint arthritis or something to be adjusted, so he he will not uh, be uh, stuck like uh, and frozen in in, in his uh, place. Excellent. And uh, another member of the audience as well is saying, are there any special dietary management uh, recommendations that are pertinent to Parkinson's disease? It's a very a smart question. Yes, people who take dopamine, um, they have to um, separate the time for when they eat uh, protein. Like any food high in protein uh, could hold into the do levodopa or the dopamine and take it out of the system, they will not be absorbed. So I always tell them either one hour before the meal or two hours after any meal has protein in it. Um, uh, vegetarian protein or real protein or something, these are the ones that you should be like um, restricted, yeah. Uh, carbonated beverage increases the absorption of the, um, the if the patient is having delayed um, onset, if he takes the tablet and takes like half hour or more, I will ask him to drink a carbonated beverage with it so to, to uh, speed its absorption. So these are the recommendations. No, no other uh, things like uh, I, I, to my knowledge that could be affected. Excellent. Thank you very much. And another question as well, saying uh, we talked about the link between sm smoking and PD. Could you please expand a little bit more on the link between smoking and alcohol as potential risk factors? Yeah, uh, for yeah. me, alcohol, I don't have like a much experience, but it, for a smoking, everything like I remember like doing, searching it even before when I was in training also. And I found that the relation that most of the people, it's like they have less because they're, it's the diagnosis because some some of the studies said diagnosis Parkinson disease fifty percent wrong. They don't diagnose them or they miss the diagnosis. Why is that? There are so many confounding people who are smoker. They have much more trouble to think about their slowness, or they don't need even to move, so they will not be detected and they do not live long. Like they have, like for example, especially in the, uh, our area, they have lung disease, COPD. They have heart problem. They have like etc. and they like extra like more of a, a problem. So. The concept of it's like protective, I could not absorb for the coffee, maybe because I found some studies like I, I supported like for the coffee could be for alcohol. No, I don't. I don't know. I, I, I didn't um, I didn't um, investigate that one. 
Thank you. Uh, another question from uh, uh, Reem saying, is taking physiotherapy to alone sufficient or uh, do you need medication uh, along with it? So I- uh, Early, early in the disease, that. yes, could be efficient, especially if it's not interfering with the activity of daily living. If it's not bothering early, yes, of course, some, some people do, but having said that, sometimes uh, there is a new study, like they're talking, delaying the levodopa, it's just prevent um, your patient from the benefit of better life. If he is still um, um, benefiting and um, uh, from the physiotherapy is not restricting something, yes, of course, I will I will delay. I will start him on the, on the what we call it, the um, uh, rasagiline or MAO inhibitors, which is like a protective type, and I will observe him. Once it starts to affect his life, I will kick in with medication plus the physiotherapy. Uh, excellent. And yeah. just to link up on, on that question, we have another which says, what options are available when dopamine agonists are no longer effective for patients? Oh, it's uh, the dopamine agonist. If it's not available, we, I mean, it's not effective anymore. It's the levodopa, yeah. carbidopa itself, the standard, um, the, the one we do, like um, it's, um, it's a good one. And uh, these are the two like a strong uh, type of things. And, and uh, there are so many families are coming extended release and these things. And the, uh, the other options that we have, the amantidine, and say these are weak dop dopaminergic. They will not be the sole one if the um, patient in need. So you have to go either with a levodopa and this one. If if it's if it is still um, if it's still not helping, if it is still not helping, uh, so then we have to think for the advanced management. It's like using Dudopa, using um, uh, apomorphine, or using DBS, etc. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And one more, one more question saying, can you comment on bone health in Parkinson's disease, if you've got any uh, opinion on that? Um, actually, as we said, uh, people with the Parkinson, the risk factor, they found that the vitamin D is low and this one. So it's better to optimize any possible things. For example, not only bone health, I will optimize that uh, because they are moving less and they have the chance to have like a um, um, weaker bone. Also B12 the deficiency, also iron deficiency, also vitamin D. I always correct all these ones so the patient will have the basic support for the, the dopamine system to work properly. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Hanan, do you have any further questions in the meantime? Uh, no, 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 not for now. Yeah, uh, I had uh, a, a question, Dr. Adli. Uh, yeah. It was uh, about the um, clinical manifestation of symptoms. Mm -hmm. we, we do know that the prodromal phase is usually characterized by psychiatric uh, symptoms, uh, the, uh, for example, sleeping for long Appreciate periods that. of time, and yeah. uh, sometimes you even have autonomic uh, symptoms as well. How challenging is it to screen for patients and make a definitive diagnosis in Parkinson's disease? Because I noticed, for example, in, in clinics in the UK when I was there, that uh, there is a, a large number of patients who are misdiagnosed with, with other care conditions which are related to Parkinson's disease. And by the time the, the, you have a definitive diagnosis, it would be quite difficult actually to manage the condition. Oh, okay. I, I haven't seen like something like you said so severe like this one, but um, mm -hmm. uh, most likely if you have some unexplained depression or you have like insomnia, you have like a REM behavior disorder, these are all red flags that we ask also our colleagues in psychiatry or in the sleep lab to consult yeah. us to look for subtle findings of, uh, of uh, Parkinson's disease or to do the uh, neuroimaging. We do the PET scan. The PET scan will give you like a hint if you have this one. So these are the people that you initiate the treatment earlier if you if it's possible to diagnose them yeah excellent thank you very much uh, i had another question we know that uh, for levodopa has been the gold standard for treating parkinson's disease for so many years probably since its introduction in the 1960s there have been quite a lot of reports on um uh, interventions that aim for neuro restoration or neuro protection although it's faced with a lot of skepticism uh, what are your thoughts on that? Or do, do you think that uh, there are things in the horizon that could be a breakthrough in treating Parkinson's disease? There are the, the person I worked with, Dr. Maris, in, in Toronto recently uh, in the 2020 or something. There's one that I didn't have the chance to uh, go over it, but she was, but not for um, old onset, it's young onset uh, Parkinson disease that they found some molecular something like for early diagnosis or targeting uh, treatment. 
So mm -hmm. it's a recent, like a, a few months, like the publication, Dr. Maris. Uh, something in the horizon, of course, there are uh, things on the horizon and there are like uh, more and more going studies for this Parkinson. So much more money are being poured into. Um, but for the um, uh, old onset or something, I so far, I don't think um, uh, the usual onset or age of onset mostly is the, the what we use the DBS or the other uh, treatments, the advanced or surgical intervention. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we have more questions from the audience while he's saying what is the next step if uh, levodopa and carbidopa are not effect effective anymore? Yeah, and then in this case, as we said, we have to adjust, I mean, see which one suits the patient better, either the apomorphine injection pump or dupa or a DBS, deep brain stimulation. Thank you. Uh, and, and a further question from prevention point of view, do you offer any awareness campaigns about Parkinson's disease, how, how to reduce uh, to, to reduce it, the risk factors or increase awareness on, on, on risk factors? Of course, before the Corona hits like the area in the last two years, one and a half year, we were running something with the Hamad University and we had a very successful campaign and they were like always, especially people with a Parkinson's on disease like family history for example we had a family like a father and son and they were like testing for others and they're like a close monitoring but unfortunately since the, the corona came in we became like much more busy with our own uh, service like now but hopefully things will clear up and we'll go back again to do more That's... in that regard okay fantastic uh thank you uh another question is the increase in use of cannabis and cannabinoids in uh, contemporary medicine a concern for me, I don't, I don't have much. I don't read about that one. They say some benefits, but I, I never tried it in my practice. Okay. Uh, another question. I think it's the link between Parkinson's disease and other neurological conditions saying, could epilepsy turn into Parkinson's disease, or maybe there is an association between the two conditions? We, we talked about some association with other diseases like frontotemporal dementia. We talked about some like a um, um, Lewy body uh, Parkinson or something, but epilepsy, as, 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 as we, we say that if you go to a disease that affects the cortex, seizure disorder will kick in. And if you have like a two unprovoked seizure or something, then you are diagnosing with epilepsy. So an indirect association, of course, there will be. Because um, as this um, the cyniculonopathies or something like in, in um, um, expand and involve the cortex, seizure disorders will come because you know, like, it's involving the gray matter. But yeah. as a, like a major one, like a major one, we, what we mentioned, we were talking about like frontotemporal dementia, dementia, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I had one question on uh, advanced um, stage Parkinson's disease where there is an issue, an issue of difficulty to swallow dysphagia and the complications that come uh, with it. How do you usually approach it in the clinic in terms of uh, exploring the formulations available for, yes. for drugs? Yeah, first of all, we um, we have to take the proper like the direct like history is exactly is it what type of it's like a swallow a swallow for solid for material and then we ask for a speech and swallow assessment and see if there is like a risk of aspiration or this and so if there is, of course, they have like certain training also in the physiotherapy for the muscles of the neck and these things. Then it's the um, issues of using um, 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 an alternative way of feeding. So to prevent uh, aspiration. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I think I've got one more. Can you comment on the impact of cognitive decline on daily living for Parkinson's disease patients? Well, it's a subcortical type and it's mainly seen in an elderly type. It's like in the young onset, they have less effect. And as I said, it's an executive function. And this is a good question because so many of Parkinson's disease patients, advanced one, for example, they interfere with the management. They always make a decision that which treatment was suiting them better. And I keep telling the family because their decision making is weak in their case. So we have to keep them about the management, not to switch from one drug to another or one dose to another. So it's mostly what we see is like executive type function is frontal lobe dysfunction. Thank you. Um, I think I have no further questions uh, from uh, hey, my I... uh, side. Dr. Hanan. I... Yeah, I have I have a question, if possible. Yeah. Um, Doctor uh, Doctor Olam, we are living the time of COVID, and mm -hmm. everyone is talking about the effect of COVID on their on the patients or the clients that they are seeing. 
Um, from your experience and the patients that you are seeing, can you tell us or can you comment on the effect of COVID on on the clinical feature of, of Parkinson's, if, if there is yeah, any? It's, it's a very good point because most of my Parkinson patients are very good in response and none of them like it, although although I, I mean I, they are not um uh, restricting themselves as enough like i see them sometime in the souk or something the mask is not full and this one but thanks god most of the patient or all of them uh, they didn't have any issues with the covid they will not get or if they got some like infection or something it's a mild one so so far i didn't see any effect on my parkinson disease i hope parkinson is one of the protective things for against covid i hope yeah, well, thank you. And the other, the other side of of COVID and and Parkinson's, the, I I know that it's a still, the, it's it's not definitive, and we don't have enough data. But I just want to know your mm -hmm. personal views about this talk that it's going about the link between COVID and the risk of having Parkinson's in the future. Well, I... Particularly for particularly for example, when we talk about like. A clinical feature like the loss of the smell um, as a result of COVID, and it's shared with the clinical features of a pre dromal and pre manifest of, of Parkinson's. Can, can we know just your personal views on this? I, I know this is based on the literature, but it's still very early yeah, on. No, loss of a smell is like any degenerative disease, even Alzheimer's disease could, could have a loss of a smell. Uh, for me, I cannot comment because I do not have enough um, uh, evidence. But as I said, from my patients, I didn't see any difference. Is it causative or something? It's the time to to go to show. But so far, I really cannot comment. But if it's just because of the loss of the smell, loss of the smell of any chronic illnesses, chronic infection or something, the the smell should could go. Even degenerative disease like Alzheimer disease. So no, sorry, I cannot comment on that. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think we've got two more questions from the audience. Uh, the first was, do you see people with Parkinson's disease exhibiting central auditory processing deficits? Ah, oh, central auditory. Hmm. No, I see with a visual deficit, like visual uh, type of thing. Auditory, no. Okay, it's thank you. Yeah. And uh, from your experience, do you have some patients uh, developing psychosis from Aldoba? And if yes, is there any way to preemptively prevent this? Uh, yes, yes, we do. We do have. It's one of the side effects of the disease itself, actually. Parkinson, as they, we, they age. And um, the treatment for it is like we have certain type of medication like cotiapine, clozaril. And uh, so the, some of the new one in the pipeline also came out. So, yes, we do have treatment for it. And... Um, um, Sometimes they do like a cause, like we have to balance like a, between the dopamine the, um, uh, treatment and the psychosis, the patients, but it's not for as far as I remember, if it's a pure Parkinson disease, not something else, it's not a big issue. It's like manageable. It's a, we could manage it. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any more questions from the audience? Yeah, uh, we've got one more mm -hmm. advice for carers and family members of BD patients. Oh, they, they have to lo have lots of patience and if there is any like a um, possible family, other member or something to be very um, uh, low threshold for testing because it's been provided some of the um, examination or follow up on patients uh, for uh, pre detection of the um, of the Parkinson disease. Um, uh, what more they need is the physical activity, like because ambulating their patient, bringing them to the physiotherapy or back. Uh, um, I think uh, I did see like some of the family are having difficulties like to bring this elderly to the physiotherapy or to do something at home as well. So my advice, active, active. They have to keep the patient as active as possible. Caution. Thank you. Uh, okay, I think we have no more questions from our site. Correct, Zakaria? Yeah, I think that's all the questions we, we have today. So thank you, Dr. Dr. Gollum. You've, you've managed to answer so many questions in, in a short space of time. Uh, I really thank was, you for having me. Yeah. And again, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation, very interactive. And uh, I think uh, our, our audience learned a great deal. I, I did myself and uh, I want to thank you again on from uh, behalf of the CBT team here at Cut University and on behalf of the participants who've joined us today. So thank, thank you very you much. Thank you very much. I really appreciate for this invitation. Thank you.
And also, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our moderators, Dr. Hanan and Dr. Abdurazak. Uh, again, you've helped to make this uh, session uh, very interactive and uh, more useful for our participants. So thank you so much. Thank you very much uh, for our involvement. Deeply appreciated. Thank yeah, thank you. you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zakaria. Thank you very much, Dr. Ulam. Uh, and thank you very much also for the audience for being here um, and, um, and participating today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, all of you, for having me with you. Thanks. Cheers. Uh, have a nice evening, everyone. Too. Thank you. Just, uh, just to finish off today's uh, session, for those of you who would like to complete the um, evaluation, it can be found on the on the website. So if you go to the CPD events, you can click on this uh, this link here. Actually, what I'll do, I'll put this uh, put the link in the chat, and we're always interested to receive your feedback. So we look forward to to hearing from you. Thank you again and uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you. Salaam alaikum. Thank you very much. Salaam. Alaikum salaam wa rahmatullah.